Hello everyone, welcome to this webinar event presented by the SAB and sponsored by Intuitive. From the Bronx Suite to the C-Suite, how to align clinical and economical value of shape sensing technology. Before we get started, a few housekeeping items for everyone. You have joined in the listen only mode. Please ask questions throughout using the question feature. We will address them during and after the lecture. Any we do not get to will be answered by email after this webinar. Dr. Pritchett is our SAB president and he will be our moderator as well as a speaker today. Dr. Pritchett is an advanced bronchoscopist board certified in internal medicine, pulmonary disease, and critical care medicine. He's a private practice physician with Pinehurst Medical Clinic for more than 10 years. Dr. Pritchett is active in multiple clinical trials. Dr. Pritchett? Thanks for uh, joining the Society for Advanced Bronchoscopy sponsored webinar series. Uh, this one is brought to you by Intuitive. Uh, the webinar is entitled From the Bronx Suite to the C-Suite and How to Align Clinical and Economic Value of Shape Sensing Technology. That's the shape sensing technology that's built into the ION product. And I'll talk a little bit about that and show some cases and some real world data at the end. But we're excited uh, for the main part of this talk to have Dr. Chris Vadra from CHI Memorial, uh, who probably does more navigation or guided bronchoscopy than anybody in the country. Uh, but he's also got a unique set of skills in talking with his administration and specifically uh, talking with the chief financial officers of his institution and can really help you dig into the data, let you know how to speak on their level. Uh, so that you can get what you want for your program. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Krish Badra. Thank you, Dr. Pritchett. So we have a, a lengthy agenda, but I don't want to overwhelm you, so we're going to jump right in. We're going to talk a little bit about modeling, financial modeling, and what your model looks like in your hospital, um, insights into the impact of thoracic oncology programs built around bronchoscopy, a downstream analysis, talk a little bit about billing, and then we're going to talk about how to talk to your CEO, and that'll be quite interesting. And we'll also finish off with a SWOT analysis. And at the end of this talk, we're going to dive right into Dr. Pritchett's data regarding the shape sensing technology and the value that ION has provided for his practice. So in most institutions, you're going to have some form of model. Um, and you're going to develop that. And you need to start thinking of your practice as being part of a larger thoracic oncology practice in which you're going to have a very specific model. In our case, we utilize CT screening, both with incidentals and a, CT, and a formal CT screening program. We utilize a database. And we also utilize other forms of uh, of uh, uh, systems where we allow people to come into our system. So if you look at this slide, you'll see in blue, uh, we utilize a, a, a medical program that allows us to be able to track incidentals and screening lung nodules. And then we also utilize a database inside the hospital. And we direct everybody to a 423-495 lung telephone number and that 495 lung, we utilize that moniker with lung to make it easy for people to remember and we funnel patients to navigators. And then those navigators will then assess those patients if they're appropriate for CT screening. And then we allow them to be able to obtain scans. And we have a, a really clearly defined pathway for developing a, C a CT screening program. If they have a normal scan, they'll go back to refer to clinic. If they have an abnormal scan, we allow primary care to determine and they can come to our clinic, another person's clinic where they're lost to follow up. This workflow works really well and we've seen over the years um, a significant increase in the number of screening CT scans for lung cancer. And you can see here, and this is an example of what happens when you utilize one of the screening programs that are available through lung GPS from ION or EON. Um, and in our case, we use Think Health. And you can see in this latest year, we're doing around 200 to 100 scans per month. And that's total in about 2,000 scans per year, which is pretty good for a hospital system. We're also the first site to utilize a, uh, a fully integrated mobile CT screening program. In the days of COVID-19, this has been extraordinarily important for us to be able to bring CT screening Instead of having patients come to the hospital, 
we send patient, we send the bus out to the patients. And so the things that you need to remember, it requires a, a nurse practitioner, it requires electrical and garage support. It's a moving uh, billboard and it brings the screening to the people. Um, one of the things that's really important to understand about CT screening and incidental lung nodules is that's part of upstream development for your business model. You need lung nodules to be able to perform these procedures and you're looking for patients with thoracic oncologic disease. One of the other things that's really lost for a lot of people who are developing uh, an interventional pulmonology program or advanced bronchoscopy program is they're too heavily reliant on other subspecialists like medical and radiation oncology and thoracic, uh, thoracic surgery. You need to build your practice on the back of primary care, and that's something that's extraordinarily important as you develop your business model. And then I want you to start thinking about what's it like for the patient as they go through your clinic, your system, your healthcare system, and how patients flow. And there's every patient goes through three points in their care. One is the discovery of a lung nodule, the diagnosis of a lung nodule, and treatment of a lung nodule. So if you think about discovery, this is a really good um, slide where you can look at, or a patient's lung nodule is discovered by a primary care physician, a subspecialist, an ED visit, or even if they're self-referred. And then you typically will send a patient either to a virtual lung nodule clinic, which is basically your regular pulmonary clinic, or you have a specialty clinic where you have a brick and mortar clinic where a patient is going to a dedicated lung nodule clinic, which is really the highest standard um, that you can achieve. But once you start to see a high volume of lung nodules, um, you may want to consider changing your model to include a fast track arm. So basically, I am in a large pulmonary group and we have several thoracic surgeons in town and they're all allowed to directly post to my schedule, which is a really you know, interesting model because it kind of functions like interventional radiology. And so it's something unique, but I trust my partners. I trust fellow pulmonologists in the community and thoracic surgeons. I still control the schedule um, and we do provide a hard stop. Those patients that go to a virtual lung clinic, you can distribute them throughout all of the practice partners. If you have a mid-level uh, PA or nurse practitioner, you can consider a six millimeter cutoff for a mid-level evaluation because you know that we're probably going to go through a series of surveillance. And if you have a brick and mortar clinic, you can have a dedicated provider clinic. And then once you've discovered a lung nodule and then you've evaluated them, they're gonna have to undergo some form of diagnosis if that's appropriate. So if you think about this, patients are coming in through primary care medical radiation oncology, going through a CT screening program. They're going to land in one of several sites. One is a general pulmonology clinic, an interventional pulmonary and thoracic surgery clinic, or a virtual lung nodule clinic. And then they're going to undergo a diagnostic procedure. In this case, it's going to be obviously, since we're all bronchoscopists on this talk, likely a peripheral navigation bronchoscopy. And that's going to have some... Uh, uh, downstream associated with it, which is anesthesia, path pathology with rose and fluoroscopy. If the patient has a negative result or a benign result, they go through surveillance and then you'll continue to follow them in clinic. If they're a positive result, they're going to go to your nurse navigator if you have one. And if they have a negative biopsy, which does happen, patient may need to have a repeat biopsy of some kind. And if they're positive, then they're going to go to one of many different downstream clinics, and that could include genetics, multidis multidisciplinary lung tumor clinic, medical radiation oncology, thoracic surgery, general pulmonology, the interventional folks, including interventional palm, GI, radiation, or radiology, um, and then palliative care and hospice. And so the average time it takes for a patient to go from discovery to treatment is on average of uh, uh, 90 to 180 days in the United States. And so in our institution, based on a COC survey, we were able to get patients in um, th uh, to treatment within about three weeks, which is really what you want. And then of course, there's also gonna be survivorship. Um, and that's a feature that as your program develops, you can include. And then when you put it all together, you want that patient to go from discovery to diagnosis, to treatment in a very fluid motion. If as your program building, you need to have this to be able to make sure that your program is moving 
smoothly for the patient experience because ultimately that's what we care about. And then I'm going to get very data oriented here. We're going to talk about what's it like to be an advanced bronchoscopist or a proceduralist in the world of pulmonology. And so I always talk to other interventional pulmonologists and bronchoscopists and they might say, hey, I do a thousand cases per year. Well, that's probably not the case um, because otherwise you won't have a life. And I do nothing but bronchoscopy. I don't have, uh, I don't do uh, intensive care. I don't do clinic. I sit in a suite all day and I do procedures. Uh, that wasn't always the case because I started off slow and steady. And so if you look at this, you know, when you're talking to an uh, interventional pulmonologist or an advanced bronchoscopist who says they do a thousand cases per, per year, you really, it's like an alcoholic. You have to divide by two rather than multiply by two. Um, here you can see some cyclical variation as you go through this, gra this, uh, this chart. Um, you can see that I was probably doing anywhere between 10 to 20, or 10 to 30 cases in the early parts of my career. And then you see this orange line, which is like that the, the moving the twelve month moving average, which is like the stock market, where you see the trend line moving. This trend line was moving it from two thousand and twelve to two thousand and sixteen into the forties. And now in two thousand and twenty, I'm doing anywhere between sixty and seventy procedures. So you can build, and then there's only so much that you can do because you still have to have a life. But that's how this happens. You can see that there wasn't a lot of movement in the beginning. And then if you look at this and the number of pre, uh, number of procedures per year, this is one patient as a procedure. So this could be just a thora, or this could be as complex as a rigid bronchoscopy with airway stent placement or a navigation bronchoscopy. 2012 and 13, you'll see that you'll have, uh, I had 300 cases, and then that kind of moved up gradually over the years. But pay attention to years 2012 and 2013. You say, well, you really didn't even grow very much. Well, there is a, uh, when you're growing your program, there is a phenomenon known as disease complexity. Surgeons have already figured this out. So if you think about this, when you're doing your RVU calculations and when you're trying to figure out what your procedural CPT codes are, a thoracic surgeon doing a chest tube for one hour versus doing a lobectomy for one hour, you know that that lobectomy is worth more for RVUs and more, more in terms of CPT codes. And so you'll see in 2012 and 13 where I did the same exact number of procedures, the disease complexity grew. And if you look at this slope, you'll see it's a, it's a straight shot out of a cannon. It just continues to grow from 2012, 13, 14, and 15. And then you look here and you say, what are the charges? And charges are not collections, obviously, but this includes both procedural and EMN codes. You'll see that the charges were 2, uh, 289,000 when I first came in, yeah, to Memorial Hospital, and that was a colossal waste of money. And four years later, I was charging around 2.24 million. And now we charge around 4 million plus just for the procedures that I do, including the EMN codes. And so again, I'm not bragging about how much in terms we're charging or how much we're doing, but just look at that curve. And remember, it takes time to be able to build a program. But once you do, the most important question is what's happening, what's happening to your patients? And if you look at this, this is going to be cancer registry data. This is data that's available in your institution. It's published on a three-year delay. Everybody has access to it. Um, and so that's something that you need to keep in mind that that's readily available for you and your, uh, at your institution. So here you can see, we're gonna talk about one metric. We all know that bronchoscopy, you might be dealing with metastatic breast cancer, thyroid cancer, prostate cancer, but I'm gonna only talk about one metric and that's lung cancer, because it kind of gives you an idea of what can happen when you go to scale. So here you can see in 2012, we did only about 100, 100, 130, 140 patients worth of procedures. And by 2014, we were doing over 400 patients undergoing radiation therapy. That's not one patient, 33 treatments. That's one patient, 400 different procedural courses of radiation treatment. So, um, so that's a lot of radiation that's inc that increased as we diagnosed early stage lung cancer. 
and also our surgeries increased as well. Um, this is at a time when our, our surgeon was actually working at multiple different hospitals, and since when he got hired into our system, he's even, you know, considerably increased, almost beyond doubled uh, these numbers, but we saw a 27% increase in the number of lung cancer surgeries. And then you start thinking about interventional radiology. So interventional radiology, when I first came here, said, hey, we have a new bronchoscopist. He's going to do all the lung biopsies. We're probably not going to be doing any more lung biopsies. Well, guess what? Um, interventional radiology during the course of my tenure here at CHI Memorial had, inc had increased 40% from 2011 before I arrived to 2015. So just listen to that. So I just told you that I increased in volume significantly, but so did they. The interventional radiologist also increased. And so what's the end result of this? When you see interventional radiology, interventional pulmonology, lung nodule uh, diagnostic software um, uh, put in, or uh, lung nodule tracking software put into institution. Well, this is where you see the difference, at least from a patient level. And this is from my institution, published on a three-year delay through the Kendrick Registry. You can see here 2012, 13, 14, 15, 16, all the way to 2017. Look at the stage one lung cancers from 91 to 179. That is a 96% increase in stage one lung cancer diagnosis. And then if you look at the total number of lung cancers in our institution, that also increased 36%. And then we stage shifted 10%. So we had not only more early, uh, early diagnosis of lung cancer, we had an overall increase in the number of lung cancer patients, and we stage shifted. That means we were catching people earlier in the disease process. So let's pause for a second. I just told you that, hey, I did well as a proceduralist because I built a program. I was able to increase the number of procedures. Then I told you that patients underwent more radiation therapy, more cancer treatments, more surgery. My, inter my competitors, the interventional radiologists, also increased in volume, and patients did better. We caught more lung cancer patients early, and we brought more business to the hospital. And so then we talk about downstream financials. And you've got to remember that downstream revenue is really what makes this, this model work. So let's look at this. This is really interesting data. In 2012, 13, and 14, and 15, which you can see at the top of this, we're going to look at the total contribution margin, the contribution margin per case. And then we're going to look at the group of pulmonary physicians. I included both myself and four other practitioners in my group that could do both EBIS and NAF. And so it wasn't just me, you can't do this alone. You need partners, you need a group. Uh, and then look at the thoracic surgery. We had one and we had about, we had some retirement and some uh, new hires and radiation oncology. So we had a, some people coming and going, but let's go through this. So our thoracic surgeon had a contribution margin of around 741 thousand that increased to almost a million the total pulmonology increased from 722,000 up to 2.14 million so we were doing our part we were doing more cases we're catching more we're doing more uh we're increasing our revenue our down or excuse me our our contribution margin and then radiation you i told you about those numbers they increased from 176,000 which is really low up to 1.194 million so really the most startling change was in radiation therapy but then look at that last line on the bottom the grand total in 2012 um we had 1.6 million in contribution margin that increased the next year to 2.5 million then to 3.7 million then to 4.3 million, and so on and so forth. And so when you're talking to your C-suite, all of a sudden you realize that you're building a program that adds value to the hospital in terms of dollars and cents. And the most important thing out of this slide is that you remember this word contribution margin. Contribution margin is not gross, not you know before taxes. This is the actual profit from your thoracic oncology program when you're doing the downstream analysis. 
And so instead of, you know, when, you know, I hear this from everybody, when I talk to other people, you know, you're asking for a stapler, they say no, they give you the slow no, they take forever. And so this talk is really to understand your worth. And so the impact of really navigational bronchoscopy and EBIS is really that your thoracic oncology program will grow substantially. I, the charges for myself grew tenfold, radiation oncology grew sevenfold, interventional radiology, my direct competitors also increased by 40%. It isn't until now in 2020 that I'm actually seeing some cannibalization on their side. Um, and then we have lung cancer surgery increase, and then we had a downstream revenue increase from 1.6 million to 4.3 million. And most importantly, we're providing care that allows a stage shift to incur. And we're increasing the early diagnosis rate of stage one lung cancer. And that's powerful data. So how do we take all that data? How do you take all of that information where we said, yes, you can build a program. Yes, other people benefit. Yes, the hospital makes money. But then when you're sitting in front of the C-suite and you're starting to ask them, how do I purchase, you know, quite frankly, expensive capital equipment? How do we do that? And that puts us into a little bit of bind because it's really difficult when you're thinking if you're a, a if you're a, a pulmonologist and you know you're thinking about clinical data, that's where your goal is. But how do you take that information from the Bronx suite and bring it to the C-suite? And how do we talk about a product like Ion, which could be very impactful to your practice? Well, first off, we need to talk about some healthcare economic terminology. And this is going to be a little bit painful, but Bobby Majahan did a fantastic article in Chess, and I'll refer you to this. But we're going to talk about contribution margin. That is the actual contribution for profit for your procedure. You need to know that number. Also, there's such thing as a variable direct cost. Those are uh, costs associated with utilization and, and really tied to the level of production. So let's say we, I utilize a medication called Sugamidex, which is you know, a paralytic. This is just an example of what a variable direct cost is. Well, the more cases I do, the more that cost goes up. That's a variable direct cost. Then there's total revenue. That's what you charge for a procedure. And that's what's charged to the insurance company. But that rarely is ever what you really get paid. What you actually get paid is the adjusted gross revenue from that procedure. And then there's also certain things called indirect cost. That's just really, that's overhead. You got to have a building. You got to have, you got to have a parking lot. Those are not really tied into your conversation, but you need to be aware of that. So contribution margin is the most important thing that you need to be aware of. Your procedure has to be profitable. So let's talk a little bit about what the reimbursement is. And so you look at this and, you know, everybody here probably has talked about CPT codes at some point in their, and, and if you're a fellow, maybe you haven't, maybe you haven't really thought about this. Well, you need to get a PhD in your CPT codes and you need to understand what it is to get uh, to understand what hospital reimbursement is. And so, you know, procedures are tied to location. So hospital outpatient, hospital inpatient, ambulatory surgical centers are in office. You know, the majority of us are doing this in the hospital. And so these are the kind of reimbursements that we're looking for. This fee reimbursement is the, what you get paid. And then remember, you've got to subtract the cost of the procedure. And then well, the other thing is, is that you have to understand this concept of complexity adjustment. So, you know, let's, I'm going to go back in time. So I've been around for a while, about 10 years in practice. And so in 2016, if you did an EBIS and navigation bronchoscopy, CMS would, uh, would apply what they called is the multiple endoscopy rule, which would mean that you would only get paid for the highest billing code. So, in 2016, if you did an EBIS and navigation bronchoscopy, you're only going to get reimbursed for the EBIS. And really, the navigation was a wash. It, it just added to the cost. So Medicare wised up and said, boy, boy, if you're doing this, in 2018, they added complexity adjustments. And this is something that you need to drill down and you need to code and build correctly. So there is a such thing as what they called a APC code, which is an ambulatory payment code, which is an adjustment code. And if you change your adjustment code from 5153 to 5154, just a number, 
remember, you're doing the work, your reimbursement goes from $1,400 to $2,937. If you're doing an EBIS and navigation bronchoscopy with three nodes, not two nodes, but three nodes, your reimbursement, as long as you apply this 5155 uh, APC adjustment assignment, you'll get reimbursed $5,440. That's a lot of money. And so you need to remember that because part of your job is not just to do these procedures, but to make sure that the hospital and you are getting reimbursed correctly for the work that you do. So the other thing is, is so when you're walking into that C-suite, you have a problem in your mind, right? You're the clinician. You're not a business person or what well, you'd like to be, but you're really not. So you're the clinician. You're trying to solve a problem. So when you're trying to think of trying to purchase ION, you're trying to biopsy, you have a problem, you have to identify that problem. You're trying to biopsy lung nodules that are smaller than two centimeters, and the ION platform does that. So you're the clinician, and the CEO is on the other side of the table. And remember that they're protecting the institution, and they're wanting to grow or maintain market share. They don't know anything about lung nodules. But you need to be able to have that conversation and you need to keep sight of the problem that you're trying to solve. So what's some, you have to do some preparation, right? Before you talk to the C-suite, you need to make sure that you have your direct contribution is positive and you need to develop a performer. So meeting with your senior accountant is really helpful. Try and calculate your direct contribution margin. If you can just, if you can't figure it out, use the numbers that were in this slide deck and then try and figure out how much it costs for you to have your equipment and then try and subtract that and figure out what your direct contribution margin might be. And then you need to know what your actual volume is. You can't walk into a room and say, I do 300 cases when you only do 100 cases because your CEO will know what your actual volume is. You can say that you wanna grow from 100 cases to 300, that's appropriate, but it's not appropriate to overestimate your actual volume. You need to calculate your downstream revenue. If you can do this, you're golden, but if you can't, that's okay and then start formulating a performa. The folks at Intuitive can help develop a performa for you. And that's important to understand. So if you're really, if you're sitting there and you're, you know, you're like, boy, um, you know, this sounds like a lot of work. No, it's not. They can help you with that. And so keep that in mind. And then one of the things that's really important, and this is something that's really hard for a lot of bronchoscopists, pulmonologists, and interventional pulmonologists, is that, your success is really built and predicated on relationships. So my advice to you is if you've never talked to your CEO and you walk in there and you say you want something, they're probably gonna just feel you out that first time. So you need to have a regular meeting on the table with your CEO or directors for your service line on a regular basis. And then you need to identify key role players. That could be your thoracic surgeon. Maybe you need to partner with them. Maybe you don't need to partner with them. You need to identify who are the obstacles. Is it your partners? Is it somebody else? What is it? But identify those key role players and engage them and engage them early. If you're interested in buying ION or some other platform, you need to sit down with them and tell them, hey, listen, I'm looking for your support. If I utilize this system, I'm gonna be able to diagnose more early stage lung cancers that are less than two centimeters. Hey, that might be of interest to you, as a surgeon, can you help me in this endeavor? So keep that in mind. And then this is, you know, this is going to sound really corny. And if you've ever taken a B class or a business class, um, you need to have a, some frame of mind going into your meeting. And and, and I'm going to be really honest with you. you. You've got to make this really focused. You want to stick with short, relevant, small talk. You don't walk in there and ask for, you know money. You have to have some small talk. You got to be able to sit down, slow yourself down, and have a nice conversation about something. Pick something that's neutral. Pick something maybe about their family um, and pay attention to what they're talking about. Let them be at ease. You need to be at ease as well. You pick at the spot at the table that's worthy of you. Don't sit on the other side of a table that's 20 feet away. Try and sit at the head of the table if you can. Consider what you place in front of you. Don't walk in with a laptop, 45 pieces of paper. Just walk in there and just walk in there by yourself if you can. Less is more. 
don't apologize for being there. You're there for a reason. You take control of that meeting. You run the meeting as a conversation. And you know, talking about a spot at the table, if you're a tall person, let's say you're six foot four, you can stand up and talk to and look the CEO in the eye. If you're a short person, sit down on the chair, but make sure you maintain eye level. These are, are these are really unique insights, and this is all data driven uh, information when you're talking to the C-suite. Talk about data and insights selectively. If you have a whiteboard, go for it, um, but manage that clock thoughtfully. Don't lose sight of what your goal is and then lock down action items. When should we meet again? What do we do next? What's the next step for us? Remember the contribution that you bring to the institution. We are a new entity in the system. We're not thoracic surgeons, neurosurgeons. We're not these, um, you know, heralded top of the pyramid um, physicians, but we are equally important because we are gatekeeper physicians. If you take Mike Pritchett out of Pinehurst, you take me out of Memorial, there's going to be a significant drop in the lung cancer volume, lung nodule biopsies, thoracic oncology. You are important to the system. So remember that. You add clinical benefit to patients and you have a monetary value. This makes people uncomfortable but data has absolutely no emotions. You're talking about finances because it matters and don't feel uncomfortable. Take hold of those and don't get emotional about it. Don't feel strange about it. Talk about those numbers. And then remember the value. So intuitive shape sensing technology is in a class by itself. It's a complete departure from EMN and other technologies. And so keep that in mind. That's a unique value that it offers. It has excellent precision, stability, vision, and reach. The other thing is, is that remember there is a such thing as a halo effect. And what's a halo effect? You can have a positive halo effect or a negative halo effect, and they even call it a horn effect if you have a reverse halo effect. But that a positive halo effect is if you're a a primary care doctor and you have a robotic endoscopy program versus a place that doesn't have a robotic endoscopy program, you might be perceived as the better place to go to if you have a robotic endoscopy program with something like ION. Uh, ION. Remember that ION will help you decrease the inventory of multiple catheters and EWCs. Like in my institution, I have six of each size of 180s, 190s, so on and so forth, and, and extended working channels. I have to have $36,000 worth of equipment. And with a, a platform like ION, you can drum that down to just a single catheter because that's all they need. You can have better outcomes, improved case times, and boy, wait till you hear what Dr. Pritchett has to say because, you know, he's he he's a fast mover, early adopter. Wait till you see his data will speak for itself. And the other thing is that you need to know as a physician is that bronchoscopy is a terrible business. What did I just say? Bronchoscopy is a terrible business. Why? It's like the airline industry, right? You've got expensive equipment. Like, like airplanes, your expensive personnel, like pilots and doctors. You've got expensive ancillary help with, doc, with nurses and techs and respiratory therapists. So how do you make value out of this type of technology? Volume, volume, volume. And one of the things that's really interesting about Intuit, and if you see how they have uh, they have disrupted other technologies like prostate cancer, they don't sell you a program. They don't sell you a platform and walk away. They want to build a program around you. And so that's incredibly important. Do you know that there's 800 systems in the United States for ENB? And then the average number of cases on each of those systems is around 30 procedures per year. That's really telling data. So this is from IBM Watson. So there's, there's a significant number of dead accounts, right? And so the promise of Intuitive is really that they're going to try and build a program around you. And they've done that historically. That's what they do. That's where their disruption is. That's where, where they take off. And just keep that in mind. Now, you need to hold yourself accountable. You walk into that C-suite 
and you tell them you're going to do 500 cases of navigation, you better hold yourself accountable. You better tell them what you think the appropriate growth is. So remember, the other things are is that C, I'm going to start at the top of this, this, this circle here. CEOs change. So every uh, on average, a uh, healthcare CEO changes every five years. So chances are, if you're going to be sticking in the same place, you're going to probably see that CEO change over. The other thing is, is don't overpromise. Like we said, give yourself appropriate time as we went through all of this early data showing that it takes time to grow a program. Do not be discouraged. Do not up and leave your program. A lot of bronchoscopists, um, who are who are passionate often get up and leave because they feel underappreciated. Just put in the time, and remember, CEOs are CEOs for a reason. You know they know how to say they know how to do slow nos. They'll say, "Hey, let's let's think about that. Let's talk about that again. Let's uh, develop a business plan. Let's have a meeting. Let's set up a strategic. Let's, let's talk to strategy." They know how to say no without saying no, and so remember, they're CEOs for a reason. And you need to be able to talk through that and be able to make sure that you can communicate and look past that. And remember, they've been negotiating far longer than you have. So have confidence, take your time, do what you can to kind of push forward. One of the things that I really encourage is to do what we call as a SWOT analysis in the, in the business world, which is looking at strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats SWOT SWOT analysis to look, but look at internal and external events. So one of the things that's really important is that you're building your program and something like ION is more, uh, more, our new technologies are more easily introduced. We know that programs built around ION will attract patients and revenue. You might even be able to have specialty care for rare and difficult to treat disorders. And a concentrated procedural practice allows other manpower to be able to uh, focus on other areas of need like COVID-19 and, uh, and COVID units. Um, and then you have a, offering a technology-driven medicine enhances the market penetration. You'll have increased inpatient, outpatient consultations. Obviously, you have increased procedural volume, and we've already shown that you can have increased downstream revenue. So what are the weaknesses? So this is something that's really important for bronchoscopists in general to really understand, is that if you sit on your laurels, and if you're 10 years in the game, and you've been at this, and you stop asking for new equipment, and you stay, like if I just stayed current with my 2010 training, I probably wouldn't be doing a whole bunch of that. I probably wouldn't be doing a lot of innovative work. Um, and so you staying up to date with innovative technologies like ION are gonna be really important. Understanding your relative value versus your relative input. So your partners might say, hey, you're, not, you're playing around in the Bronx lab, but you're not up here you know, working like a, uh, uh, working really hard in the ICU with some of these difficult patients. But remember, you offer some significant value in terms of thoracic oncology versus the relative input for call. Refusing to purchase capital equipment or invest in future technologies or ample space or appropriate number and type of personnel can sink your program. So keep that in mind. You need to push for this. And you need to be aware that thoracic surgeons, ENT doctors, uh, IR, anesthesiologists may create obstacles. You need to have those relationships. So those are weaknesses you need to tease out. You need to look at the opportunities, philanthropic donations. Our program you know, has, has acquired over uh, several million dollars in, uh, in donations, which has been really helpful. We've been able to build new buildings, new practices, new equipment. Um, and Robotic navigation systems help increase rather than decrease surgical referrals. That's extraordinarily important for your thoracic surgeon to understand. Um, and it can offer, you know, more referrals, et cetera. Now, what are the threats? You know, obviously, if you're going to purchase new equipment, break-even points can be delayed. It can be one or two years. And the other thing you need to be aware of, what if, what if the hospital down the street buys an ion before you do? What are you going to do about that? You need to think like this. And so that's extraordinarily important for you to understand is that it's a competition. You've got to stay ahead. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Pritchett, and he's going to talk about his experience with ION. All right. Thanks, Chris. Um, 
hopefully everybody can see my screen. Uh, so, you know, Dr. Badra is just really giving you the keys to the kingdom there in terms of how to talk to your C-suite. Um, and, and so that's exciting. I've kind of, you know, I've done this talk a bunch of times, but I really have tried to tailor it really with the message in terms of talking to your administration and, and the things that they want to hear. And I speak from experience, uh, not only experience using this platform, but also experience I had to put my political capital on the line and actual capital on the line to say that I wanted to buy this system. And so there were some things that I had to go through, and I, I learned a lot from Chris's previous talks in terms of how to talk with my C-suite. So this is, you know, he mentioned, you know, doing those sub two centimeter lesions, and that's what I want to impress upon you is that the status quo is not good enough. We need to go after smaller and smaller lesions. We can't be happy enough with, you know, Chris showed you a fantastic stage shift that he's shifting a lot of these to stage one, which is fantastic. Um, but once we get to stage one, I want to do a further stage shift because there is a difference between a stage 1A1, 1A2, and 1A3. Look at the five-year survival rate there. And tell me, if you were diagnosed with lung cancer, if you'd rather be diagnosed at 10 millimeters or at 30 millimeters, okay? So when you're looking at studies and you're looking at technology uh, about what you're going to purchase next, focus on the average lesion size and the diagnostic yield. Those things are uh, important. Uh, and so, again, it may literally result in, in saving someone's life. Uh, because there is a decent difference between 92% and 77%, okay? Um, I mean, think about oncology medications, immunotherapy, and things like that, things that are approved because they keep people alive, you know, 11% longer or, uh, you know, for two and a half more months they, they lived, and, and the oncology community jumps up and down and publishes it in New England Journal. Um, but we're talking about five-year survival difference uh, of, of, you know, 15%. All right. So if you look at NLST, we can kind of extrapolate from that data that about 36% of those malignant nodules in the National Lung Screening Trial uh, were less than 10 millimeters. Uh, but unfortunately, we're only biopsying about 6 millimeters or 6 percentage, sorry, 6% of those lesions that are 10 millimeters or less. And so what we want to do is we want to drive those thoracic surgery programs, just like Chris was talking about, and we can do that significantly by pushing more of these patients towards surgery. We know that the five-year survival rate for lung cancer is abysmal. Only about 25% of patients are treated with surgery. But if you look at NLST, we know that simply by finding these patients early, we can improve their five-year survival, and that's because a lot of these patients can get pushed to surgery. Now, not every patient is a surgical candidate. If they were, you know, we'd be out of business as bronchoscopists. Um, also, time is money. And I don't want to talk more about dollars than this. You can kind of just put this in your mind. But it is less expensive for a hospital system, and this is the language that they speak, it is less expensive for a hospital system to diagnose patients at an early stage. Um, and this is a you know, publication Tom Gaudet at the Cleveland Clinic put out a couple years ago, uh, but it's impactful. And this is something that you should have with you, you know, when you talk to your C-suite. So we know what the problem is. We have suboptimal diagnostic yield with our current technologies. We have to do additional procedures because we failed to make a diagnosis. We have to do CT-guided needle biopsies. The yield is good, but it's not perfect. It has a higher complication rate, and you have no ability to stage the patient. Certainly, you can do surgical resection or surgical biopsy. That's more costly, more invasive, higher complication rate, and it's just not suitable for all patients. Um, I, I love how we post cases and things like that, and, and then, you know, on Twitter, we get attacked and we say, why would you biopsy this? It's, you know, 1.2 centimeters. You should just do surgery and take it out. It, it's great to sit in the ivory towers and just assume that you know this patient and that they're a surgical candidate or that they want to have surgery. More and more patients and surgeons, by the way, are asking for a diagnosis before they do a procedure. EBIT staging is also something that we want to do all together in the same thing. So in general, we have a lack of confidence going after small lesions. And in my opinion, that really defeats the purpose of doing lung cancer screening. If you find an 8 or 10 or 12 millimeter nodule and you say, I don't have a safe and effective and reliable way to get you a diagnosis on this, 
you got, you're going to go home and go to sleep every night for three months thinking that you may have lung cancer until I do another CAT scan. Um, and that's just not acceptable to me. We know from looking at the Nelson trial, the distribution of lung cancer is small, peripheral, and difficult places to get to. So you're going to have to have something that can get you to those places. So how do we bridge that gap between where we are with diagnostic yield and, and you've seen numbers all over the place, 60%, 70%, you know, the acquire registry, 38.5% for electromagnetic navigation bronchoscopy. But remember that the acquire registry had a very strict definition of yield. You either got it that day or you did not get it that day. It wasn't about CT follow-up or did it disappear in six months, so it was a little bit more strict. Um, but we'd like to be up around 90%. So we know that navigational bronchoscopy platforms have evolved. The original Super D has been very successful. I don't think any of us would be here right now if it wasn't for Super D. I know that Chris and I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Super D. Um, then you have platforms like Varen and newer robotic uh, platforms uh, like Oris Monarch. Um, but those are all still tied to electromagnetic navigation, um, which has issues. Um, you know, listen to the most recent AABIP talk, the Battle of the Robots. It was a very interesting discussion. And they talked about when you bring your C arm in, um, that there's deflection of that target. It, you know, it changes uh, your view. Uh, and so that's something that's still a little bit problematic. There is some optical recognition in there. Um, but the cool thing about ION is that it's an entirely new navigation system that's based on something called shape sensing. So there's no external electromagnetic generator hovering over your patient uh, or getting in the way of fluoro or cone beam or anything like that. So this was kind of the evolution of the design for Intuitive. Um, they started off with a scope and scope design with a camera that was continuously on so you could watch your biopsies, and they had an external EM generator. That was in 2013, and what they realized uh, is that they can do it better by getting rid of electromagnetic, by getting rid of the camera, and by making a catheter smaller um, than what's out there now. And so this is the final design here. Um, you see the catheter at the bottom right. The catheter on, picture on the left shows you when the camera, or what we call the vision probe, is removed and when it's in place. Um, so this is what shape sensing looks like. It's this uh, fiber optic uh, uh, channel that's built into the catheter, and it always knows where it's at uh, in all three dimensions at all times. So that tiny microfiber is built into this 3.5 millimeter outer diameter catheter of ion, um, and so that's the basis for your navigation system, and we're finding uh, that it ends up being uh, very accurate. So let's talk about the evidence because you should definitely weigh the evidence before you make any big decisions. Um, as you'll see in the top right, this is not the system you see today. This is the um, prototype system that was used in the first in human trial in Australia. 29 patients, so small study. They were looking at lesions between 10 and 30 millimeters. Um, but this small study wasn't satisfied with going after lesions two and a half centimeters. They weren't satisfied um, you know, with saying, oh, we can only publish localization success. They went with small lesions and had a high diagnostic yield. Um, interestingly, the mean number of generations that this thing went out is 6.7 generations, even as far as to nine generations. And that's something important to look at uh, in the data when you take a look at that as well. But look at the median uh, nodule size, 12, 13 you know, millimeters uh, with, a little, with not too big of a range there. You see really nothing was over 16 millimeters in this study. Uh, so it was really impressive that they took a brand new technology and were gutsy enough to go after very small things and have a diagnostic yield of nearly 80%. Um, diagnostic yield for malignancy, 88%. So then there was a, a cadaver study that was published. This was 20 you know, uh, artificial lesions in a cadaver. Again, less than two centimeters. And so what they did with this, they took the ion robot, they took the legacy superdimension system that did not have fluoronav, uh, the ultra-thin scope with Rebus in the hands of somebody like Alex Chen in this study, and drove it out to the lesion. They found out where they were at, wherever the machine told them they were at, stuck a needle out blindly, did a cone beam scan, and you can see an image of that in the bottom right. So how often was the system correct? Again, there's a lot of critiques and criticisms of this study, so take it for what it's worth, but the robotic just by itself, needle in the lesion 80% of the time, 
the original Super D without uh, fluoronab and alumicite, which is widely available now, at 45%, and ultra thin and rebus, uh, only 25%. Um, so you know that there's a precise trial coming. This is six centers, um, uh, mostly uh, major academic medical centers, and then Pinehurst uh, as well. And um, this is looking at uh, follow-up for 12 months and looking at lesions between one and three centimeters. And this is our data. So I'm going to share this with you pre-publication. Uh, keep in mind that this is unpublished. This is from only my site and does not reflect how all the other sites are going to be doing. We were only enrolling 60 patients. We did 69 lesions. We, also, we often go after bilateral cases uh, or multiple lesions. This is without the assistance of cone beam. Everybody who knows me probably associates me with cone beam. Um, we were not allowed to use it in this trial. So 84% diagnostic yield, and remember that very strict acquire registry definition? That's what this is based on, because we haven't had time for follow-up. Um, so this is either we got it or we did not. Average lesion size, 16 millimeters. Pneumothorax rate, two lesions out of 69, none of which had any uh, chest tubes placed and none of which had any bleeding. So what about a learning curve? What about somebody who's never done robotics before, Again, you saw uh, Oris published their paper, and I kind of call that the learning curve paper um, because they had five sites uh, that gave it to each user for 11 cases, and then they kind of took it away. Um, so this is kind of a similar thing, 12 cases in a month, median lesion size, 14 millimeters, diagnostic yield was 85%. So I think that's pretty respectable in terms of somebody who's learning uh, this for the first time. So if you look in the study, we started off with bigger lesions, we got smaller, and then by the time we hit 50 cases, our median lesion size was 14 millimeters. Our case time is also quick, and this is something to think about when you talk to your C-suite or when you talk to your OR. How many cases can you do in a day? We can now comfortably do six uh, ion cases in a day and walk out of there at 3.30 or 4 o'clock. Um, so we have a lot of cases under 30 minutes. We have a lot of cases with multiple lesions. Um, and so that trend continues on. These are a couple of very quick screenshots of some of the cases that, uh, that we do and the things that we traditionally go after. If you'll see in the red circle in the top left, that's the time of the procedure, and that includes the, registra the registration process. So again, three minutes uh, to a positive rebus sign. Uh, here's three minutes and 20 seconds to a really difficult paraspinal lesion. Uh, the lower lobes are always more challenging and difficult, but you see how accurate the system is, and you see how quickly we got, not just to the virtual lesion, how long it took to get the actual lesion confirmed with radio probe. And again, these were not cone beam cases. Um, this one, one of my favorite cases, this was a small cell carcinoma that we got in you know, five minutes. Um, and the flexibility of this very small catheter at 3.5 millimeters is, is pretty astounding. Uh, and then again, four minutes, again, not only just to navigate out to the lesion, but to register, navigate, and confirm with radio probe. So these cases are getting pretty quick. Yes, we do cone beam here. Um, we do ion plus cone beam now that we're outside of the study. And what this shows you, this is the co this is the power of these two technologies combined. Where you have the ion catheter, you have augmented fluoroscopy from the Philips cone beam system. We look at it in one plane. Certainly looks like we're there, but it's important to look at it in multiple planes. Here we can see we're actually slightly posterior to the lesion. So the precision that this system gives you to pick your direction aim that way, and then you're right in the middle of the lesion, it's quite impressive. This is certainly going to come in handy when we start talking about doing ablation. Look at the tool in this very small six millimeter plural based lesion, uh, and then we can verify that in all three planes. So there's several examples of that. So what about our data when we're able to use cone beam? Um, here's just another example, a little eight millimeter ground glass lesion. Um, so this is our data when we finished the precise trial. We were sold, we bought the robot. This is updated literally as of yesterday. We hit 100 patients uh, since the precise trial. Um, 120 lesions in nine months, a diagnostic yield of 93%. That's with cone beam when we need it. I used to do cone beam at the very beginning of my case. It was the first thing that we did. Um, and then we use the augmented fluoroscopy. I don't do that anymore. Now I navigate after the lesion, I look with radio probe. Uh, if I struggle, I'll do a spin, but if I don't, I just go ahead and start biopsying. 
So we're doing a lot less comb beam with these, but it is uh, necessary um, in some cases. Average lesion size 15 millimeters. The yield for lesions 10 millimeters or less. You remember that's how I started off this conversation with those 1A1s, 92% five-year survival. Our yield for lesions 10 millimeters or less is 86%. The smallest is five millimeters. Our pneumothorax rate is now down less than 1%. We still have never placed a chest tube uh, in an ion case, and we've had no significant bleeding. Um, so this has increased our thoracic surgery volumes. We are at a small center. I do a lot of lung cancer, but we're at a small center. Our surgeons just over the last four or five years have been doing uh, da Vinci uh, surgery. And so what we noticed is that we have a 94% increase uh, in our thoracic surgery volume compared to pre-ion. Uh, if you look at other sites that have published uh, things, MSK, Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, they presented at double ATS, 71 patients, 86 lesions, lots of multiple lesions and bilateral cases. Their diagnostic year was 86%. Again, still median lesion size under that key two centimeter mark. Again, no pneumothorax in that study and no bleeding risk. The other key thing, and Chris talked about this before, is the level of data that uh, Intuitive can give to you to help you run your program. This is a sample report of what you can get on a quarterly basis as far as your time and your cases, how much quicker they are, the average case cost, the average nodule size. Uh, they can break down the time in terms of wheels in, wheels out, how much time you spent biopsying, how much time you spent registering, um, your distribution of size, location, and nodule properties, and how many generations they are out, and also your referral base. Uh, where are your referrals coming from? And you can get this snapshot from them on an ongoing basis. So again, in terms of, of being an early adopter, I'm definitely an early adopter, but I'm not the only one. There's a lot of these um, uh, fellowship sites. Uh, so if you're hiring IPs and they're coming out of practice, uh, if they're coming from these you know, reputable institutions, they're likely to have experience uh, with this technology. And so they are uh, early adopters. So if you look at Intuitive's history, and so that's one of the things that makes me comfortable working with them as well, is they have such a, an incredible uh, pedigree in terms of uh, developing a technology and continuing to innovate and make it better. But look at the early adopters. These are the accounts from the top 50 Da Vinci prostatectomy facilities. They account for more than nine times higher volume than the rest of the other programs. And 38 out of 50 of those were early adopters. How about gynecologic oncology? 80% of them were early adopters. And those programs that were early adopters now do seven times higher volume than all the other programs. So again, when you think about this, you can say, I want to be an early adopter. I want to jump on the train early and take a chance uh, and, and reap the benefits. Um, or you can think about being a late adopter when everybody else comes in and uh, it gets a little bit more crowded. So to bring it back to what Chris was saying at the very beginning and close this whole program, how to build a lung cancer program, and many of you are already doing this, um, a weekly multidis multidisciplinary conference is key. Thoracic surgeons who are skilled in minimally invasive surgery, nurse navigators and coordinators are huge. A nodule or incidental nodule management software uh, preferably with radiomics like HealthMind or something like that, um, you really need to drive your lung cancer screening program. If they're not doing enough, then you need to raise hell and get them to push your lung cancer screening program. You want to utilize treatment guidelines uh, for outcomes, formal continuing medical education, emphasis on early detection, um, and have a cancer center that allows for many services to be offered at a single location, and obviously you want access to, to clinical trials. Um, so that's the end of my presentation. Um, I'm going to take any questions, and I'll kind of moderate these, and I'll, I'll feed them to Chris. Feel free to please type your questions in the chat box off to the right, um, and, um, and we'll be happy to answer these. Um, so one of the questions that we have, uh, you know, for Chris is, how did you come up with all of these numbers from your site? Did they just give them to you? Did you make friends with somebody? You know, how did you go about, because I, I've heard that some places are kind of stingy with their numbers. How do you get your own numbers at your own institution? 
So that's a great question. Um, so I uh, actually called a senior accountant in my hospital system, which was three different hospital systems. And I quite frankly told her, hey, listen, I have a problem. I'm asking for uh, capital purchases, equipment, personnel, uh, more operative time, and I'm having difficulty communicating exactly what uh, my worth is. And so I'm a downstream revenue model. And I explained that. And then I said, can we do a downstream analysis? And what was really interesting was that the senior accountant over three different hospitals, over a thousand beds, um, actually had never spoken to a doctor in her 20 to 25 years that ever come to her with this kind of request. And so that was kind of interesting. So I think one of the things that you can do is obviously go and reach out to uh, your individual uh, senior accountant, your CFO, and try and get, drill down on some of this information. And I think if, if you can get their attention and develop a little bit of a relationship with them, you can get a lot of this data. Um, and if you can't, um, the things that you really do need to know that like you have to tell them is that uh, give me my contribution margin, give me my volume, and then start tracking some of your internal data. Because if you if you can show and demonstrate growth and contribution margin that's reasonable, um, then you are already way ahead of a lot of other physicians that are in the queue who are asking for new equipment. Great, great. Um, so that's fantastic. I'm gonna give it just another minute to see if there's any questions here. Anything else you wanted to add or or actually you get to answer or ask any questions you want also, Dr. Bondra? Well, one of the questions that I had for you is that looking at this combination of robotics and, and comb beam and, and, and as most people know who, who know me, I do a very high volume of comb beam CT bronchoscopy, and one of the things that people really fret about is uh, case times, um, you know, the, to dock and undock. Uh, and those of you who've seen other robotic platforms, one of the things that's really interesting is that the ION platform is really quite easy. And so can you speak to that, um, how quickly your case volumes, because I remember several years ago you were telling me you were doing two cases in the morning and two cases in the afternoon. And now you're doing five or six cases. So what's that like uh, as far as your flow and its uh, integration with Comb Beam? Because I know with the Monarch uh, system, uh, it doesn't really jive well because of that external G, uh, GPS uh, that kind of bumps into the Comb Beam machine. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so our case times have actually been um, uh, pretty good and they've gotten quicker and quicker. Certainly you're always gonna have a tough case that you struggle with and it's gonna take a while. Um, but we've really been able to, and the addition of another partner obviously has helped. Now I can kind of be in two places at once. So, you know, when I finish my eye procedure and I switch over to um, say EBIS, he can go consent the next patient. So that's definitely helped. Uh, but the case times themselves um, have actually gotten a lot um, shorter. Um, so, and that definitely makes us more efficient because they're only going to give us so much block time um, before they, you know, uh, before they give us any more. And so we have to take advantage of that and we need to work quickly. So we have a great crew and a great turnover. Uh, the turnover has nothing to do with the robot. Usually while we're doing EBIS in the room, they're turning over the robot. And by the time I'm even finished with EBIS, they've got it switched over and we're even ready for the next case. So that's, that's not a holdup. Uh, there's one more question here. I kind of knew this question was coming, so I was ready for it, <laughs> which is, um, you know, does the lack of vision while you're biopsying make a difference in your opinion? Again, I think that you have to qualify this exactly as the, the person who asked this said, which is, in my opinion. So this is my opinion. Um, I, I thought that it's something that, that may uh, make a difference, and there's no doubt that, that watching a needle go into things it has the cool factor. Um, but as you've seen from our data, it does not make a difference. Um, a lot of times once you start biopsying, you start getting bleeding and, um, you know, as you normally would, and then your camera is, you know, fogged up or covered anyway. Yes, you can still inject saline and do some suctioning, but when you suction that far out, um, it typically, um, it just closes off the airway anyway. Uh, the one advantage, if you if you want to think about it that way, I can actually take my camera out and clean it and put it back in if I need to, but I rarely have to reinsert the camera. I think just having the camera itself and being able to see the airways and things like that that far out 
is really impressive. Um, but all I can do is relate to my own experience and my own data, which is based on the data, and it's not just mine, it's like feelings data, it's MSK's data, it doesn't make a difference. Um, so that's what I would say. Uh, let's see, um, have you seen an increase in referrals uh, due to your results? I mean, it, so we definitely see some referrals. Um, you know, it's actually pretty interesting uh, that, you know, we're kind of an inbred group of people. We all know each other. I just had, you know, a colleague at the Cleveland Clinic just refer a patient to me because they had their surgery up there and then they have a nodule and so he already lives here. Um, yeah, in general, and I saw one patient today who, you know, Google's online and they want to know where the best place to go is, you know, in a reasonable area. They didn't come here from California or anything crazy like that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that there is an increase, um, but really screening is what drives the vast majority. Um, what What would you say, Krish? Yeah, I think so. I think it's twofold. One is is that obviously for stage shifting and the early stage lung cancer uh, increase is really driven in part by the technology of peripheral navigation. Uh, screening most programs are not robust enough to really add a tremendous amount of volume, but that is actually the ticket to grow your program. So meaning that it's a competitive race between you and the competing hospitals to wh whoever can capture the largest screening population. Um, to give you an idea what the economic value of screening is, uh, so uh, typically this is data, and I'm gonna botch the numbers a little bit, I think it's $770 in downstream uh, from one particular case, plus the direct contribution, which is you know for these low cost scans, probably a around $100. So, just think about this when you're talking to uh, your uh, C-suite is if you have, let's say you're doing 5,000 scans with around $800 of both direct and, and downstream contributions, just to, and that's a low estimate I'm giving you, you're talking about uh, uh, $4 million per anna, annual income um, in terms of impact to the organization. So that screening leads to more diagnostic procedures and other the the S that's in the lung rads, the other significant findings, um, and other interventions that can be both life saving and beneficial to the patient. So there's a lot of value of creating those types of programs, and I would really urge everybody to look at like uh, HealthMind and look at other programs that are um, really can help you fast track your screening program to grow uh, at an accelerated rate. And, and you probably can speak a little bit to that. And then once you do that, your clinical volume of bronchoscopy and your procedural program will just grow rapidly. Yeah, that's a good point. All right, uh, so with that, I think we're gonna close. Uh, we really appreciate everybody. This webinar is gonna be able to be accessed from the SAB homepage, uh, which is sabronchoscopy.org. Uh, keep in mind that we'd love you to join SAB uh, and become a member. There's lots of great benefits, and um, there are benefits uh, to those uh, who are members uh, in terms of uh, uh, content, conferences, um, and things like that. So we'd love to have you join us, sign up if you would, and uh, we're going to be making our announcements for our next webinars. We've got some uh, some uh, scheduled non-sponsored webinars coming up uh, with some great